Welcome to our webinar. This is the first in a series of three webinars um, hosted by ANS. Um, my name's Kate LeMay and um, I work in the Canberra office of ANS and uh, I have a history that I was a pharmacist and then I worked in medical research um, and now I'm at ANS as a senior research data specialist and I work um, with our uh, programs and information services where we uh, are dealing with sensitive data and in particular health and medical data. Uh, so, as I said, uh, this is our first webinar in the series that we're going to be speaking about funders and publishers in relation to the publication of health and medical data. Our second uh, webinar is next week about storing and publishing health and medical data and the third webinar is the week after on the 23rd of May about ethics, legal issues and data sharing. So I just wanted to quickly introduce a few uh, concepts to everyone about ANS because uh, some people this might be the first time that you've come into contact with us. Uh, so we're an NCRIS facility funded by the federal government and we work to make Australia's research data assets more valuable for researchers, research institutions and the nation. Um, so just a bit of a background to why we're talking about uh, you know, sharing health and medical data. Um, firstly, the Productivity Commission uh, has put out a report that just was released yesterday about data availability and use. It's a very long report and that's um, got the potential to change the data sharing landscape within Australia. Uh, in addition, there are several international um, medical research funding bodies that have uh, got policies about uh, data that, have, that is from research funded by them being required to be shared uh, and uh, there's a lot of uh, researchers within Australia who are working on collaborative grants with people from overseas uh, from these funders who are already um, coming into contact with these policies where they're needing to share the data that comes out of these uh, projects. And there's also uh, quite a few uh, journals, both internationally and uh, in Australia, that are either thinking about or um, implementing uh, policies around um, requiring statements of data availability or for data behind the um, findings from that paper to be made available. So the last thing that I would like to uh, point out to you before I hand over to our speakers is that ANS has quite a suite of resources for medical and health data, uh, and this uh, is one of the this slide is one of the handouts that's in uh, GoToWebinar. So feel free to download it and have a look. But it's basically pointing you to um, our sensitive data homepage where you can go and explore all of these resources that are related to medical and health data. So now I'd like to introduce our three speakers. Uh, so firstly, Weiming Boon uh, is a senior research scientist in the Research Translation and Policy Branch of NHMRC and he provides scientific and policy advice towards MH NHMRC strategic projects and peer review. Previous to that, he was the research director at the Hart Foundation and a research fellow at Monash and the Flory Institute. Wiming also has Jeremy Kenner in the room with him, um, who will be speaking a little bit um, after Wiming, and he's the expert advisor for ethics at the NHMRC's Evidence, Advice and Governance branch. At NHMRC, he's responsible for and contributes to a broad range of programs and projects related to health and research ethics, clinical trials and governance of research, and provides advice internally and externally on these matters. In his earlier career in the United States, he worked as a teacher, practiced law and conducted public education and research in bioethics. And uh, Wiming and Jeremy are both in Melbourne and we've also got Peter Odinger also in Melbourne who's a senior journal publishing manage manager at Wiley and he's worked at Wiley for over 10 years in the research team on health science and life science journals. He's worked in publishing for over 20 years um, for various publishing com companies in the Australia and the Middle East, such as Lonely Planet, Ex uh, Explorer Publishing and The Age. So I'm going to hand over to Weiming now and Weiming is going to um, speak about the NHMRC statement on data sharing. Thanks Kate and uh, thanks to Anne for the invitation. So, so as you know, NHMRC is a supporter of open, open access in general and has an open access policy for research. Uh, supported by NHMRC since 2012 and the original open access policy mandates um, 
that all publications are to be made openly accessible within 12 months of publication. And in recognizing that data management and data sharing is a major benefit to researchers and the community in general, NHMRC has released a statement encouraging data sharing in 2014. So, so it doesn't actually mandate data sharing, but rather encourage data sharing, and that's because uh, the data field is evolving very quickly while the field is maturing. And it's also for other aspects of data to actually catch up first, and these can be ethics, um, privacy, technical and quality issues um, that faces everything that, that is data related. And not to mention the actual skill and knowledge that is required to think through the whole process of data sharing as well. So if you looked at the NHMRC data sharing statement, it actually talks about the use of life cycle thinking when it comes to data. And life cycle thinking basically means that data management should be thought about even at the, the planning stages of the project and not just at the end as an afterthought. So thinking about how data is actually managed from the outset will ensure that the quality of the data is high um, and the security and accessibility of the data is managed well and the life of the data is managed and made available hopefully forever. And, uh, and I'm sure many of us have come across this situation where we get to the uh, where we needed to go back to some data from years ago and the data is stuck in a lab book in a garage somewhere or in a floppy disk with no easy way to access it. And, and I know I've been there at the end of that, that cycle you see there um, and not being able to find data at the last minute. So that's what we're trying to avoid at the same time. So the data sharing statement is, is aligned with overall government strategy um, of data sharing and, and as Kate has mentioned the Productivity Commission just released a report yesterday and uh, we are totally aligned with, uh, with things um, that has come from government as well. So all in all, um, sharing of data is about maximizing the benefits from data derived from a, quite a limited pool of resource and minimizing wastage. And it's also about considering the community and the ethical aspects of the data sharing. I mean, as the collectors of data, we have the ethical responsibility to ensure that data is used properly and not wasted. So it is basically to make the best use of resources coming from public funds and the moral obligation by way of being ethical in, in the research behavior that we have. So leading on from this, it's, it's worth noting that the challenges faced by NHMRC and health and medical research in general is quite different from, say, sharing data in astronomy, engineering, or music. Um, the challenges include privacy of individuals and patients when dealing with health records, um, genetic information, overall health information. And other tricky sections uh, include sharing of uh, clinical trials data and in particular non-aggregated data. And, um, and these are some of the things that we, we often need to think about when coming up with policies at NHMRC. So I'll now I'll pass you on to my colleague Jeremy Kenner who will talk to you a bit further about this. Uh, good afternoon. Um, the NHMRC is as the uh, peak body or, or the expert advisory body uh, in Australia for, for research ethics and um, research governance issues under the code of conduct, uh, which, which we're not going to be discussing today uh, explicitly. Uh, we, pr we produce guidelines um, and one of the, the most significant one that we produce for um, research ethics is something called the National Statement on Ethical Conduct in Human Research. So this, uh, this document, which has been in existence in one iteration or the other since 1999, and was preceded by earlier statements, um, is uh, a bit, a bit unusual on a global stage because it is much shorter and much more succinct and much more principles-based than some of the other documents, for example, in the United States or Canada, which are much longer and more detailed. It's a, a document that mixes high-level guidance with some prescriptive guidance and some recommendations for best practice. It, <clears throat> there are sections of the document, five of them, that, that uh, cover the various uh, things that are listed on the, on, the, uh, on the slide, the key principles, the main issues of consent and risk, special considerations for different categories of research and different populations involved in research, and then the establishment operation of HRICs and institutional and research responsibilities. This document applies to all human research, but importantly, it applies only to research 
and only to that research which is, involves human beings or their, uh, their biospecimens or data. Other documents cover, for example, animal research and activities that are not research but um, sometimes have similar ethical issues such as quality assurance activities, audit evaluation, um, etc. This document's undergone a full review um, in between 2004 and 2006, yielding a document in 2007 that is the current document, although it's been amended in, small, in, in various ways since then. It's now undergoing a, um, an ongoing review, and we are uh, addressing first one of the, this section that deals with the various categories of research. Um, and additional sections will be reviewed in, a, in accordance with priorities that have been set um, by uh, uh, virtue of con consultation with the users of the document. So uh, regarding data, the guidance in the national statement really attempts to achieve two core objectives. The first is for researchers to understand and to minimize the risk of the unauthorized use or disclosure of sensitive personal information that they've obtained for these in, in research. So it's a, 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 an awareness raising activity. Um, and the second is to ensure the appropriate collection, use, and sharing of data or information so as to maximize the ethical use of the data and information and research. And this presupposes that it, it is, in fact, um, ethically appropriate to uh, share data as to the extent that is, is, um, is ethically appropriate and in ways that are ethically appropriate. So in order to do this, in order to achieve these objectives, you need some principles to guide the consideration of the ethical implications of the specific research project. And you also need some suggestions for resolution of the tensions between these two core objectives, that is to minimize the risk and to maximize the use. The, the necessary framework for the, of the principles, including what, what, we, what is phrased in, the, in must language and in should language, um, is, is part of the national statement. It also includes prompts for consideration by reviewers regarding whether the proposed mechanisms or processes that they wish to use to address or mitigate the risks or adequate, adequately protect participants and are ethically appropriate, acceptable means of maximizing the use of the data. But the national statement doesn't provide prescriptive directions regarding which mechanisms or processes to use, um, except for some broad exceptions to that. And that is for uh, ethics committees and other reviewers to um, make assessments uh, based on their own judgment of, of what um, is proposed for a specific research project with reference to the national statement and other guidance. Now, it's often the case with ethics um, that uh, these, these two core objectives are intention and the national statement and the, the pro including the prompts are exist in order to help people um, address those tensions and mitigate the risks as much as possible. Um, one of the things that it also doesn't do is it doesn't address the legal uh, aspects of data use um, with reference to, for example, privacy legislation, although the ethical guidance in the national statement takes cognizance of the existence of privacy legislation and um, the, the, over, the, the general concepts that are, are part of that. And in fact, um, the NIHMRC has responsibility for developing the guidance for, uh, for researchers with respect to the application of privacy legislation. So this national statement that we've been discussing, um, the section that deals with uh, considerations specific to research methods or fields is in the final stages of revision as we speak. Um, it has been radically reconceptualized and restructured so that it does not uh, specifically refer in categories to types of research as its overall structure. It's it's redesigned to address the elements of research, which are listed on the slide here, um, that uh, are characteristic of most, if not all, research projects. And um, it then provides a very specific guidance for certain kinds of research that don't fall into um, uh, as the, the, more, the more generally applicable categories. And this includes uh, research involving biospecimens, laboratory-based research involving biospecimens, human biospecimens, uh, genomic research, and uh, there will be a new chapter related to 
uh, something called xenotransplantation research, which have very specific requirements that don't apply. Otherwise, the rest of the categories of research are uh, all part, all, all subject to the guidance in the in the uh, section generally, with specific comments related to, for example, clinical research. Um, uh, but they are not separated. It is not separated out as a separate category um, for a variety of reasons. In each of these elements, there is guidance on the ethical considerations related to the use of data, and um, obviously, in particular, in elements four, five, and six. However, um, each of the elements uh, addresses um, uh, these issues in particular. Uh, for example, um, the types of things that need to be notified to participants in the consent as part of the consent process. Um, in addition to the national statement, although this wasn't uh, specifically explicitly on the agenda, um, there is a national ethics application form, which is no longer called the national ethics application form, and has now been replaced by something called the Human Research Ethics Application, HREA. This document will be of great assistance to researchers in developing their projects as well as submitting the, for their proposals. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a portal, not just an application form. The key point I wanted to make here was that there are three sections of this form, one full section of which are questions related to data and privacy. And so there are 18 questions in this section related to data characteristics and activities that are planned for or with the data. Uh, and this, of course, references back to the national statement, but includes um, considerations and questions that researchers need to address um, that uh, go beyond the guidance that's provided in the national statement document. Uh, so thank you for, for, for uh, the, the opportunity for NHMRC to contribute to this session today. Okay, fabulous. We're going to have Peter speak now. Um, so thank you so much, Wiming and um, Jeremy, for sharing us, sharing with us those um, policies and things that are happening um, at the NHMRC. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Well, thanks, um, Kate, for that, and thanks to Anne for inviting us um, to speak in this webinar. I guess firstly, I just should say at Wiley, we're committed to open science. Um, we believe in it strongly as. I guess essentially it's, it's our business, disseminating research is our core business. So our, our open science strategy focuses around five main things and I'll just explain those quickly now and then go into detail on a couple of them later. So um, open access, nearly all of our journals um, offer some sort of open access um, through our programs, our open access programs. Clearly we help improve the visibility of research and comply with various open access mandates. Authors, of course, can retain copyright and choose appropriate licenses as they wish, such as Creative Commons, etc. Open data, well, that's um, the re reproducibility and verification of research data methodology and reporting standards. Well, we take this seriously. Again, we are committed to open data and to improving the openness, transparency and reproducibility of research. We don't recommend any limiting licenses as such to our partners and suggest and use various Creative Commons licenses. We think this um, protects the long-term integrity of the research by making the data, methodologies and reporting standards openly available. It also complies with some funders who um, request that data be shared, of course. So thirdly, open standards, collaborative, interoperable and global dissemination standards. So new digital first technology and infrastructure infrastructure helps increase the discoverability of um, research, of course. New technology and infrastructure helps to publish journal articles that integrate all major research outputs, text, images, uh, images, data and code, preserve more of your research activities as part of the scientific record and help other researchers find your work when and when they need it most. Open collaboration. Well, that's a more inclusive and networked research practices. So new technologies and pressures on researchers to find new ways to collaborate has seen us as a publishing company, company invest in technology to help you as authors collaborate with peers and create the best possible outcome um, for your research. So we believe this should help facilitate data sharing text and data mining for easy collaboration between researchers. So through um, annotations of work, through article sharing policies, which we support and have at every stage of production, of publication and platform text and data mining as well, 
we believe work will get out there more openly and easily. Uh, finally, of our five main points is to, um, to have open recognition and reward. That's integration of researcher identification and evaluation tools. So simply that's to increase recognition of authors and their work, to create an ORCID ID when you submit your paper, make that easy, to, uh, then you can connect you with your research activities, maximise and measure the impact of your work through kudos and outmetric, get credit in the end for your peer review work as well through publons or programs with publons that recognise and reward the contribution of peer reviewers. So through our our journal level data recommendations, well, the, the thing I really have to say is that we're a partner with societies. We don't uh, publish most of our journals on our own. We're partnering with colleges, societies, associations, etc. So therefore we can't make um, our partners do anything. So we work and collaborate closely with them to come up with the best policies and the best recommendations. So there's three recommendations that we um, suggest and that is to encourage um, data sharing, to expect data sharing or to require data sharing. They're the three main ones as you can imagine. So our recommended default position for our society partners is to expect data to be made available. Um, it's probably a little stronger than what uh, Wayne Ming and Jeremy were talking about before where they um, encourage. Um, so I, it's really up to each individual journal and society. So generally many researchers will be uh, more across this than me, but check what your society wants, what your journal wants, what your funding body wants. So then there's some um, data ex accessibility statements. So these are a consistent way that articles can point to the data that informs their results. So these statements should be placed within an article to identify where this um, data is held. So it should include how the data can be accessed through a DOI or a link, for example, what conditions are placed on it. You know, again, is it a Creative Commons license? Is it a restricting license? So that's really important. And finally, there is the data citation structure, like a journal citation referencing. Um, this has to be there to ensure consistency. Now, currently, it's often referenced in different ways. We don't have a clear structure for it, and we are working with other bodies to come up with a, I guess, a simple way and a standardised citation um, information for the data. So, what do we do, and how do we make it easier for our authors? Uh, the first thing we do is suggest um, that you, as an author, choose the best way that's for you. If, if your discipline has a certain place to um, uh, store the data, that's fine, do it that way. But if, if you don't, um, we have, we suggest and we recommend the use of Figshare. So we um, have done this in a seamless way through our submission stage, so therefore all authors can put their data up onto Figshare at no cost to them and um, in, a, in, in a seamless way. So we don't have a strong view on where the data should be held, as I say. That's really dependent on journal or discipline, but we do suggest and recommend Figshare. It's, it's easy for authors who, who submit their papers to Wiley journals. So um, using this repository is free, can be dealt with at submission stage, and is pretty easy and seamless for authors. Now, so. I think I've run through my five minutes, but that's all right. I'll just summarise basically. So our position on health and medical data is pretty simple. We strongly support the open science, open data, believe it will drive faster and more efficient research. We recommend data policies to our partners and only recommend, but ones that are appropriate in their fields and which encourage, expect or require authors to make their research data accessible. And finally, we facilitate this by encouraging authors to use their most relevant repository or, as I mentioned, we give free and easy access to the Figshare repository. So thank you. Thank you very much to uh, all of our presenters who've joined us today. I hope that uh, this has uh, been able to get the message across to all of our uh, audience who've called in that there's a movement uh, in the sector both from publishers, uh, funders within Australia and um, internationally that um, everyone is thinking about data, how it supports research, how it helps uh, reproducibility of research and uh, will improve uh, outcomes for, you know, particularly in the health and medical field, improve outcomes for patients and people with, you know, 
uh, medical conditions who want better treatment, better outcomes. Uh, so uh, we've run out of time today. So thank you very much to our presenters today and thank you to everyone who has called in today.